So I've lived all over the globe, but I'm not unique. I think a lot of you here, actually I know a lot of you here, have also lived all over the globe, or you know people who lived all over the globe. And even if you've never left Ann Arbor, I know you work with and interact with and play with and just live with people from all over the world. So globalism is actually a reality for all of us. We all live on a global stage. So today I just want to talk to you a little bit about what are some of the skills and competencies we need to be successful in this global stage. Now it turns out this is a pretty important goal for higher education today as well. Um, one of the perks of being a faculty member is that you get to go to a lot of graduation ceremonies and listen to speeches. And actually, all graduation speeches are basically the same, all right? They talk about how high education actually equips our students with the skills and the know-how that helps them deal with some of the big challenges and big changes in the world. And what these changes are and challenges are may differ depending on the speaker. Uh, but one of them is always there, and it's the change or the challenge of the world being more diverse and more global and more multicultural. So it's really true, regardless of whether you're getting a PhD or MBA or Master in Social Work or Bachelor of Science, regardless of your profession or your discipline, you need the skills, you need the competencies, you need the knowledge, you need the mindset to actually thrive in a global world. And indeed today we see that people who have these global skills um, do rise to the top. And, oh, and my favorite is Carlos Goshen, who is the CEO of Nissan and CEO of Renault, so a Japanese and a French automaker, auto company. And he is really well known for his ability to thrive in multiple cultural settings. So as you see, he has a very multicultural global background. All right? He was born in Brazil, moved to Lebanon, studied in France, and then worked in France and Germany and Brazil and the US. And now, you know, in his role um, as CEO of these two car companies, he lives in Japan and France. Now, Goshen is a big hit in Japan, which is impressive because this is a culture that is sort of well known for being suspicious or skeptical of foreign influences, right? So uh, Goshen is a sort of a small handful of non-Japanese individuals who actually ran a US company, but he is one of the most successful ones, okay? He took over Nissan when the company is in a lot of trouble and turn it around really quickly. But he's not just well known for being an accomplished, a talented business person. Um, he has gained wide acceptance in Japan um, uh, beyond the business world. So I'll give you an example. So a recent magazine did a poll um, asking people in Japan, who would they like, what celebrity would you like to rule, run Japan, okay? And so Goshen came in at number seven ahead of Barack Obama and way ahead of the actual Japanese prime minister. Um, um, here's another example. In Japan, comic books are very popular. And there's actually a comic book where Carlos Goshen is the protagonist. You know? So here he is um, using his superpowers to, I don't know, run a meeting or something. But um, so he is a hero in a, in a comic book. And perhaps most impressive of all is that there is a bento box that's named after him in Japan. So a bento box is a lunch box. And um, should I have a picture of that? <laughs> and um, so this is a lunch box where uh, it's actually targeted to uh, busy executives who have no time to eat lunch. So they can, and it's a popular, the Carlos Goshen uh, bento box is actually quite popular in Tokyo restaurants. And I took a look at this and Look, they have, I want to point out, this is calamari for his glasses. And there is like seaweed, I think. And this, this is a hot dogs and eggs and, you know, salad. I don't know what everything is, but a nutritious and savory meal. <laughs> so, um, all right. So what are these global skills and competencies that I've been talking about? Um, what do I actually mean by them? So I want to uh, just introduce you to sort of a few of these skills that I'll be focusing on today. Um, so the first cultural skill or competency that I'm going to talk about is cultural adaptation, which is generally how well people do when they 
uh, how well they adapt to a foreign country that they move to. So there are a couple of components to this. So for example, whether you change the way you think, the way you behave, what sort of knowledge you gain from the new culture, do you master the language, do you make social relationships, do you start getting to have relationships with people in the local culture, do you consume the local media, do you watch the you know, television, do you read the newspaper, etc. So it's how well you adapt to the new foreign culture that you move to. And then a second variable is cultural intelligence, or CQ, and that's sort of a takeoff on IQ, all right? And um, CQ sort of is talking about a, a sort of a general competence that you carry with you that doesn't just apply to a specific culture, a specific country you might move to, but you can apply it to any kind of multicultural context. So in a way, it's like IQ, right? IQ is not just about performance on one task, but it's something that sort of can broadly apply to a number of different tasks. So, um, so cultural intelligence, or CQ, uh, talks about other kind of components. So awareness is knowing that cultural differences matter, being aware of them and conscious of them, right? So knowing what types of behaviors you need to adjust when you're in a multicultural uh, global situation. And motivation, that's really about do you feel confident when you're in a multicultural setting? Do you enjoy being in those global situations? Do you seek out those opportunities? So um, that's CQ. And then a third variable that I'll be talking about is creativity. So that's just being generally open to new ideas, having multiple ways to think about a problem. This has nothing to do with culture specifically, but the idea is that when you uh, are exposed to different cultures and different global perspectives, you would just be able to think about all kinds of problems in a more creative way. So these would be the kinds of global skills or global competencies that I'll be talking about. So back to um, Goshen here. So how do people like Goshen actually develop his global skills and competencies? Well, the first clue is probably his background. Like I said, you know, just Growing up, he's lived in all these different countries, and then he worked in all these countries. So this, just moving to different countries and adapting to them and doing that all through his life probably helped him build some of these global skills. So, so that's the question that I first asked. Do these past global experiences actually help people like Carlos Goshen build these his global skills? So um, I want to study Carlos Goshen, but he was too busy turning around Nissan to uh, answer to my survey. So I had to try to look for some, a bunch of people that uh, look like Carlos Goshen. Um, and I actually found them in France, um, where I looked at uh, some students who are in a business school in France, okay, right outside of Paris. And this is one of actually a top business school, um, and, but they have a very interesting student body. About 90% of the students are not French. That means about 90% of the students are international students. Okay? The students come from 36 different nationalities. Not a single group um, in the student body, not a single cultural group, it's more than 10% of the entire student body. So we're talking about an extremely diverse student body, a very global student body. Right? So it's a very unique environment here. Um, so I got some of these MBAs and I got them to fill out a survey to tell me about their cultural life experiences. So I want to find out, just like with Carlos Goshen, where were they born, where did they travel to, at what age, where did they live? And then also ask them about their cultural adaptation of the different foreign countries they might have moved to. Okay. So first, I found that there are four, when I looked at these very global individuals, I found that there are actually four different groups, four different kinds. So the first kind, I will call them young immigrants. Um, these are people that have um, moved to about one foreign country in their life. And they, the first time they moved, they were eight. Right? So um, now when I say they've lived in a foreign country, I mean really live in a country, not just traveling to a country. You know, they go to a country and they, they go to a foreign country and they have to pay rent and put down security deposit, get an electric bill, all that. Okay? So the first group, the first time they moved, they were eight, and they lived in an average of one foreign country. The second group, I call them expats. So these are people typically who moved um, to a foreign country to work. 
So the first time they moved, they were 22, probably right out of college. They get a job. They are assigned to a foreign country. They live in one foreign country on average. Then there are these global cosmopolitans. And what are these people? It's not an alcoholic beverage. These are people that have lived and worked and studied for extensive periods in different cultures. So again, they first start moving when they are young adults. But they've lived in average of three foreign countries. So that's a lot of moving around. And then the last group, we call them third culture kids. Now, third culture kids are people who have spent a significant part of their developmental years outside of their parents' culture. And you see that. Um, for third culture kids, the first time they moved to a foreign country, they were four. Right? They're very young. And they have lived in an average of four different foreign countries. Now, I think that these third culture kids are most like Carlos Goshen, right? And, um, and they have really the most global experiences. They've lived in the most countries, so they have varied global experiences. They've lived in many foreign countries. And uh, moving around and adapting to different cultures is a, you know, a, a big part of their lives. It's part of their inherent part of their entire lives. They've been moving around their entire lives. Okay, so this is a sustained activity, sort of going around from culture to culture and trying to adapt. So I want to specifically look at these third culture kids because they're the most global experience. Does it mean that they also have the most or more global skills? So um, I told you about this cultural adaptation measure, you know that I had, you know, how people adapt with their thoughts and their behaviors. Do they master the language? Do they use the media? All right, so these are the different ways people can adapt to a different culture. And then I have these groups. So I'm going to show you how each of these groups adapt at each of these domains when they move to a different uh, foreign country. So it would be a busy graph, but I want you to just look at the red bar, okay, the third culture kids, because those are the people that look most like Carlos Goshen. These are the people with tons of, have lived in lots of different countries since a very young age. So let's look at how well they adapt their thoughts, that change their thoughts and uh, patterns of thinking when they move to a foreign country. Look at the red bar, the third culture kids are the lowest in their adaptation of their thought processes, lowest in adapting their behaviors, lowest in gaining cultural knowledge, not the lowest in mastering a foreign language, lowest in establishing social relationships with the social culture, with the local culture, and lowest in consuming the local media. So that's surprising, right? If you're paying attention, you should be surprised because it seems that the people with the most global experiences, the most varied, experience, um, the most varied and sustained changes in their cultural experiences are actually least adaptive uh, when they move to other countries. And it seems like more global experiences does not necessarily mean uh, better global skills. So, now, so, you know, let's see. So what I want to do is see if I can find the same pattern in a slightly more typical sample. Because these people are a little atypical, right? These are all mini Carlos Goshens with these crazy lives. And, you know, let's look at some more typical people that are more representative of uh, the people that we know. So what about undergraduate students? We are sort of familiar with those types. So I looked at, so in a very different study, I looked at uh, basically uh, US, American, you know, uh, undergraduate students in the US. And I compared two groups of students, the students who actually participated in a study abroad program and students who did not, okay? So these are US American students, so they're not foreign students, they're not international students. I didn't include anyone who's ever lived overseas, right? So I'm comparing these two groups, and I just measured that on uh, CQ, cultural intelligence. So again, this is more of a more general uh, cultural competency, global competency, looks at awareness or consciousness of cultural differences or motivation to be in a global setting, okay? So let's... Look at these students, cultural intelligence, the two groups, those who did not travel and those who did travel abroad. And oh my gosh, the people who traveled abroad had lower CQ than the students who did not travel at all. So again, it seems that more is not necessarily better. So when I looked at this, I just sort of wondered, 
what are these students doing abroad? You know, what is happening? How could this happen? What is happening when they are in Paris or Rome or Beijing? So when you get findings like that, you've got to dig a little bit. So I really sort of tried to find out more about what is the nature of this global experience. I know they went away, but what happened when they were out there? What did they actually do? So I started looking into the actual experiences of the study abroad programs and what the students, what their experiences were like at these study abroad programs. And I found that there were just big differences in these experiences. And I would say that there are definitely students who had a more involved um, global experience when they traveled abroad. So what does that mean? So I ask these kinds of questions. So people who had students who had, a, I would say, a more involved global experience are more likely to stay with a host family rather than stay with a bunch of other study abroad students that are usually Americans. Okay? Um, the students with more involved global experiences are more likely to live off campus rather than on campus in a dormitory. Uh, students with more involved global experiences uh, tend to make more friends from the local country rather than uh, make friends with other study abroad students from the US. Everybody made a lot of friends, but they made, you know, the more or less involved students made different kinds of friends. So, um, so given the variety of these differences, I, I looked at the same question, but divided the group up into um, students who had more or less involved experiences. And this time I looked at creativity. So this is just a general creativity task. And what we did was that we asked students to come up with as many modes of transportation as they can, except planes and trains and cars and ships and bicycles and trucks. So we have to make them think about these sort of alternative ways of thinking about transportation because we gave them all the conventional forms already. So we just counted out how many, new, how many of these unconven unconventional modes did they think about. We just counted them up. And that's how we measured creativity here. So let's look at creativity of these three groups. The students who did not travel, the students who did, who did go to a travel abroad program but had a less involved cultural experience, or those that were more involved. Okay. And so we found that um, this is the pattern we found. So now a couple of things here. Um, it's not that surprising that students who had a more involved cultural experience, so they're more likely to stay with a host family, live off campus, make friends with um, the, the local students, that they were more creative than those who were in the less involved group. I think, again, what is more surprising is that the less involved group actually had lower creativity than the students who did not leave the country at all. Okay, so that is more surprising. Um, so why is it that these two types of global experiences make such a big difference? I think one reason could be that when you um, just go overseas, you know, when, every, when all of us go overseas and live in a foreign country, I think the first thing we see is how vast and how pervasive our cultural differences, you know, that we actually can be a lot bigger and a, and a lot, you know, more vast than what we might have imagined. Uh, but when you are not living uh, with a, a local family or you don't know a lot of friends from the local culture, it's very hard to actually bridge those differences. So, you, so it's not that surprising that after that, those types of study abroad experiences that people walk away feeling less confident about their abilities to negotiate these differences. Um, it's not surprising that they, would, and they are less likely to enjoy or seek out uh, global experiences, and it's not that surprising that they generally become less open to alter alternative ways of solving problems. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this saying, well, you know, study abroad programs are a big waste of time. If I don't get to stay with a host family, I'm not going to go, you know, because I'm just going to be more worse off. So I don't want you to really walk away thinking about, thinking that way. Why? Because 
Number one, we have many, many goals when it comes to study abroad programs. I just talked about cultural adaptation or creativity, but people have other goals. So you might want to really learn the language. So if you want to learn Chinese, you just got to go to Beijing, all right? Or if you want to, if you study history of architecture, you can't do it here in the U.S. There's no history of architecture. You've got to go to Italy. So um, we have a lot of other reasons that we want to study abroad, not just creativity or not just CQ. So those are very worthy goals as well. Um, but also another thing to think about these study abroad programs is that sometimes living with a host family is very difficult. You know, maybe it's just not an option that people can live off campus. You know, the program, you know, only offers on campus dormitory living. So you don't have a lot of control over that. But that said, I think there are other ways to get your study abroad experience to make it more involved, to make it a more, a deeper experience. So for example, um, even though you might not be living with a host family, um, you don't have, in your spare time, you don't have to hang out at Starbucks with all the other American students, right? You can go to a local hangout and get to know some of the local students. Um, instead of traveling all over during the weekends, you can maybe spend the weekend at the family of one of the local classmates that you have met. So there are many ways that people can structure their study abroad experience so that they have this sort of more involved experience versus the less involved experience. And you can see it can make a big difference. So my first takeaway for this is to take a deep dive, right? That, and taking a deep dive is scary because um, you can't see the bottom um, and it's unpredictable. But um, it's, you know, what the data shows is going just Going in halfway doesn't get you necessarily halfway there, right? So um, you really need to go in all the way. So, all right, so the type of global experiences, it seems, really matters. Um, another thing that seems to matter would be the attitudes of the individuals who is actually doing the traveling, okay? So what about the attitudes of that person who is actually getting the global experience? What is that person like? When we usually think about the attitudes of the person who's doing the traveling and how they might adapt to a global situation, we usually think about the attitudes about the foreign culture. So how open they are to a foreign culture, how open they are to the country that they're going to. Right? I'm going to take a slightly different perspective. I'm actually going to talk about people's attitudes towards their own country. Not about the foreign country, but about their own country. So this attitudes towards your own country, um, we call it nationalism or it can be patriotism. And there are usually two dimensions to this. The first dimension is attachment. So attachment is feeling that I love my country and that, you know, being, uh, uh, being American is a big part of my identity. So these are all sort of uh, related to how attached I feel to my own country. But there's a second dimension to nationalism, and it's glorification. So glorification is measured by items such as uh, my home country is better than all other nations in all respects. You know, my country is the best in the world. Other nations can learn a lot from my home country. So it's not just I love my country, but my country is better than everybody else. Um, it's also called pseudo-patriotism or blind patriotism, but it all means glorification. Now, these two dimensions um, are related, right? They're positively related. If you think your country is the best in the world, you also will love your country. So people who are high in glorification will also be high in attachment. But they're not always, they don't always go together. So for example, um, it's possible to have high levels of attachment, but low levels of glorification. So some people can love their country, but still be critical of their country. They still can point out the flaws of their country. They can still poke fun at their country, all right? So we can be, love being American, and you can love the USA, but you can still, I don't know if you can see that, you can still laugh at the fact that in the US, people are taking escalators to go to the gym, okay, instead of taking the stairs. Or you can laugh at this, which is um, 
hard to explain, but you know, but you can love your country, you can have high attachment, but also low glorification. You can be critical um, of your own country. So people call this critical attachment or constructive patriotism. So I was interested in how does nationalism um, influence global skills and competencies? How do our attitudes about our own country affect the way we um, adapt to a foreign country? So again, I looked at these study abroad students, and this time I looked at the same people before and after they studied abroad. Okay? And I um, measured their nationalism, both attachment and glorification, and then also asked them to do this creativity task, this modes of transportation task. And let's look at what we found. This is sort of pre and post travel. So you can see that before they travel is the blue bars, after they travel is the red bar. This is attachment, this is glorification. So basically, the nationalism and what it, how you know, the components of nationalism didn't change. How much of the country did not change after they travel? How much they glorified their country? Uh, you know, this is US, they're all US students. Also did not change pre and post travel. Creativity also did not change before and after they traveled. Um, now, but this comparison is across all individuals. So now I want to really look at how it would look if I break down different levels of nationalism. If I take that into account, how does creativity change? So, so here, I'm going to present it this way. Zero means no change. Okay. And then the positive numbers means that creativity actually increased after people studied abroad. And the negative numbers mean uh, creativity actually decreased after people studied abroad. Right? So first look at attachment. Um, so we see here is that attachment is positively related to change in creativity. And that basically means the more attached you are, the more likely you're going to have like a boost in your created creativity after you study abroad. Make sense? Okay. So, but when we looked at glorification, it goes the other way. So what this says is that the more glorifying you are of your own country, the more likely you are going to show decreased level of creativity after you travel. And another thing to notice here is that this, this is where the action is, okay? This bar is a lot bigger than that bar. So why does glorification have this uh, negative effect? High levels of glorification basically means that we see that our way or the American way is the best way. So a different way, so when you go overseas and you see a different way, then surely that different way is worse. Why would I be open to other perspectives if I, know, if I know that they are already inferior? Or why would I ever consider an alternative way of thinking? So I think this sort of mindset that comes with glorification is actually reflected in these creativity scores. Now, I think these findings have huge implications when we think about how we prepare people for global experiences whether we're talking about students who are going to study abroad, or we're talking about business executives that are going on a foreign assignment. Um, right now, the way at least businesses, they do prepare their employees before they go on, before they send them overseas. But the standard way that businesses train their executives is to teach them a lot about the other culture that they're going to. Okay, so they give them an intensive language course, and they teach them about the business norms of that culture. So, you know, oh, you're going to this country, uh, make sure you buy gifts for your boss, and these are the kinds of appropriate gifts. And don't forget your boss's family, you gotta buy gifts for them too, and these are the appropriate gifts. So all, they give you all this sort of practical knowledge which is very useful, okay? So I'm not saying that it's not useful, but I think it's very important that in addition to teaching people about the foreign country, that they should also focus the training on how to get people to think differently about their own country, okay? So um, if we can actually effectively help people to be more critical of their own country or less glorifying of their own country, uh, perhaps we can go a long way 
in actually helping people increase their cultural adaptation or helping people develop the global skills. So my takeaway here is that you can love your country. It's great to love your country. I love patriotism. But you can also be very critical of the country as well. And that will actually help develop global skills and competencies. And this actually reminds me of a colleague of mine who actually took a group of students on a study abroad trip to India. And he told me that one of the students had a really hard time uh, during the trip because she loves ranch dressing. And she puts ranch dressing on all her food. All right? And traveling around rural India, she's having a hard time because there is no ranch dressing. And she couldn't find ranch dressing anywhere. So she was just having a very hard time adjusting and not having a good time on this program. Now, ranch dressing is good. All right? I like ranch dressing too. But if you really think hard about it, um, ranch dressing is actually very bad for you. Okay? It has a lot of fat. I actually looked it up. Two tablespoons of ranch has 15 grams of fat. 15 grams of fat. And so, um, you know, so, and, and then if, if she actually tried some of the Indian food, you will see that in Indian, uh, Indian restaurants, they serve something called raita, which is a yogurt sauce, and it's also white. It's made of yogurt and has tomatoes in it and cucumber in it. It's very refreshing and it's delicious and it's good for you, you know, and it's actually much better than ranch. So, like, another way to think about this takeaway is that um, ranch is good. Okay, it tastes good, but ra raita may be better if you try it. Actually, raita is better. So, you know, love your country, that's okay, but you can be critical of it. All right, okay, so we've talked about the person who's doing the traveling. We've talked about the type of global experiences that person might be having. Uh, what else is missing in this equation? So, we've, what else is missing is the country um, that this cultural global experience is taking place, all right? So where is the country that this person is going to? Um, does it actually matter which country you're traveling to? Does it matter in terms of your cultural um, adaptation or your global skills? So yes, um, I'm gonna tell you the bottom line, yes. There are some countries where it's easier to adapt to. Um, and I'm gonna look at that uh, in terms of historical migration. Okay, so um, here's a map showing that. And the countries that are more like red or brownish countries historically have had a lot more migrants, people moving into the country. And green countries like China, like Japan, um, historically have had fewer migrants moving in. So now this is historical migration, so migration over hundreds and hundreds of years rather than migration over the last year or the last five years. Um, I'm really focusing on historical migration because historical migration really indicates a long-term sustained openness to foreign uh, cultures. So, or a, a country's more deep-seated values um, around accepting foreigners. So it's not just, when you look at short-term migration, you might be looking at changes in recent public policies or immigration laws or recent wars that are happening that might affect the influx of immigration, uh, immigrants. So what I wanted to do was really look at cultural values, long-standing cultural values. So I looked at historic, uh, historical migration of different countries. So let's go back to Carlos Goshen. We haven't talked about him for a while. And so remember he, uh, was born in Brazil, and then he moved to um, Lebanon, and then he um, went to France. And so um, these are mostly red or brownish countries. So would it be different if his formative cultural experiences were not in these countries, but actually what if he was born in China and then moved to Finland and then went to Ethiopia? If he had gone to those countries, um, would it be different for him? So I, I wanted to look at this question. So first we just looked at the different countries and tried to find out the historic migration uh, rate, um, try to measure that. And we measured uh, historical migration using this index, which is percentage of ancestors, uh, percentage of people in the country that had ancestors that were living outside the country in 1500. All right, that's a bit of a mouthful, 
but we can do this. Uh, let's everybody think about your ancestors in the year 1500, okay? Imagine who they are. Now, how many of you would have ancestors that were in 1500 would be living in this country? Show of hands. Two, okay, all right. A small minority of this group, all right. So for most of us, our ancestors were not living in this country in 1500, all right? So U.S. generally has a pretty um, high rate of historic migration, historical migration. Um, and if you ask the same question in Japan, you get a very different answer. So countries like Japan or China or Denmark, I mean, those countries, most of the people living in those countries have ancestors that were actually living in those countries in 1500. So we use this as a measure of historical migration. So again, the question, does historical migration actually predict the cultural adapt adaptation of the foreigners who moved to that country? So let's go back to our mini Carlos Goshen's, these uh, global MBAs. Um, they come from a lot of different countries, but remember they all moved to other countries as well. So they've all moved to many different countries. So we find in our sample that there are actually 33 different cu countries that our sample moved to when they uh, first moved to a foreign country. And we looked at their cultural adaptation and how it relates to the historical migration rate of the country they're moving to. And we found a nice positive uh, relationship. So basically people are, had a higher level of cultural adaptation if they're moving to countries that have a higher rate of historical migration, okay? So we did um, another study where we looked at Peace Corps volunteers and so this is another group of people who had to travel to another country. Um, here in our sample, we have these volunteers and they're move, uh, traveling to 55 different countries. And I think the big difference between the Peace Corps volunteers and the global MBAs are the kind of countries they're moving to, right? In terms of the mini Carlos Goshen's, the people getting the MBAs, they were moving to London to get an investment banker job or they're moving because their parents got a executive job in New York or something like that. But the Peace Corps volunteers are not going to Paris or New York. They're going to um, uh, low GDP developing countries. But we did the same thing. We looked at the 55 countries that they're going to, uh, looked at the historical migration rate, and then looked at the cultural adaptation of these Peace Corps volunteers. And we find the same uh, positive relationship. Cultural adaptation was higher when the Peace Corps volunteers are going to a country that had higher rates of historical migration. So um, now this finding presents a bit of a problem for me because um, the Carlos Goshen thing doesn't fit into my story that well, all right? Because uh, basically Carlos Goshen was able to adapt very well to a country has very low rates of historical migration. Japan is very low. Um, so he should be having a really terrible time adjusting to Japan, but, um, but he didn't. So, I, you know, so let's unpack this a little bit more. So imagine if you are going, if you're asked to go to a country that has a very low rates of historical migration, like Japan, uh, or a country that you suspect is um, not that open to foreign influences, how would it make you feel? You know, what, what would go through your mind? Um, you'll probably be a little worried about how people will treat you. You'll probably expect people will exclude you. You might think that you'll be singled out. Um, you might expect that people would discriminate against you. So these might be sort of expectations that people might have when they're going to these kind of countries with low historical migration. So we wanted to actually tap into some of these expectations. Um, so in another study, we looked this time with working adults and we tried to get them to imagine if they were placed in a working assignment and they had to move in a, to a foreign country and they either, we told them either they were going to move to a country with high historical migration, we didn't use those words, but we described them, or they had to move to a country with low historical migration. And we asked them, what, 
kind of experience do you anticipate having when you move to these countries? So, um, and that we asked them about specifically experiences that might relate to discrimination. Uh, so for example, do you expect people will stare at you? What about being laughed at for making mistakes? People refusing to talk to you, being refused service, being taken advantage of. So we have a list of sort of discriminatory, discriminatory behaviors. And we ask people to what extent would you expect these things to happen? So what did we find? Uh, first, we found that people who expect to travel to a country with low levels of historical migration, like Japan, for example, or China, would anticipate facing more discrimination. Okay, so a negative relationship here, right? And second, we found that people who anticipate more discrimination had lower levels of cultural adaptation, okay, a negative relationship here. And, uh, and importantly, we found that anticipated discrimination actually mediated this relationship. What does that mean? It means that people have a harder time adapting to those countries because they expect others to discriminate against them, because they expect other people to laugh at them, because they expect other people to exclude them. Now, the cool thing about this is that because we find this relationship, we also know that if we get rid of anticipated discrimination, the whole chain falls apart, okay? So, um, so it sort of suggests that um, if you can sort of change those expectations when you're going to countries like that, you can actually break that change and you can actually help yourself adapt to a foreign country, um, even though it might be a low historical migration. So this is something you can change. You might not be able to change where you're going, but you can change your anticipations and your expectations before you get there. So my takeaway number three is that you can anticipate being an outsider, but you don't have to anticipate discrimination, right? You don't have to expect discrimination, and that's not necessary. So uh, I want to give you an example um, of this, and this is a very, very embarrassing chapter of my life, and so I will tell you this because... Um, Yes, you came here braving the cold and the rain. So I'll tell you this embarrassing secret that I haven't told anyone. Uh, so one time when I was traveling to France, I really, um, I was ordering a dinner. And I, decide, I, I decided that I would order in French, even though I do not speak French. All right? So that was one big mistake. And so I was ordering. Um, um, and uh, suddenly, um, the waiter sort of had this, you know, ashen look on his face and everyone around me all the other patrons sort of just dropped their forks and stared at me so because um, they thought I ordered a sewer rat <laughs> for dinner now they know they're very nice they know I didn't really want to eat sewer rat so everyone started talking to try to figure out what I was actually ordering so the waiter's trying to talk to me in English, broken English, and all the French people are talking to each other in French I, 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 because I don't know French. I don't know what they're saying. So everyone started talking to try to figure out what I actually ordered. And after a lot of conversation and discussion and checking on, online, they realized that I wasn't really ordering sewer rat. You know, they were wrong. I was actually ordering honey badger which is not what I was ordering either, you know? <laughs> now I don't even remember what I was uh, ordering at the time. So, um, okay, so I was singled out. I, I made a mistake, and um, that's to be expected when you go to a foreign country. But in this scenario, yes, I mean, I, I, I made a mistake and I was singled out, but there wasn't discrimination. People did not take advantage of me, you know? people did not refuse service. You know, instead, everyone chipped in to try to figure out how I should order dinner and to make sure I don't get sewer rat or honey badger, you know? So, it, you know, so yeah, I was an outsider, but there was no discrimination. And so you don't have to, you know, those two situations don't always go together. Now, so probably Carlos Goshen, also did the same thing. He probably did not expect a lot of discrimination because he's going to be CEO of Nissan. And when you're CEO, you, people probably won't, people will probably give you some respect. But, um, but anyway, um, 
So let's, and again, go back to him. Um, my my or title of my talk was sort of a little boring uh, at the beginning. It's a sort of, not boring, but a serious title. But this is an alternative title to my talk, which is you too can be, uh, can have the global skills of Carlos Goshen. You too can be Carlos Goshen. But I think what is a very important part of this is that you too can be Carlos Goshen without leaving Ann Arbor, all right? You don't need to travel all over the world to be like him. Remember that a lot of my findings actually show that having a lot of global experiences in and of itself actually do not necessarily help you get global skills and competencies, all right? But if you look back at my takeaways, um, you can do all this without getting on a plane at all, all right? So, for example, love your country but be critical of it. You don't have to go overseas to do that. I mean, we can all be critical of the U.S., especially now during the election season. <laughs> That's very easy to do. You don't have to go to France to do this. So, or, um, so no problem. You know, you can do this here in Ann Arbor. Um, take a deep dive. I mean, there are so many opportunities to become deeply involved in global community here, right? There are um, a million international students in the U.S. 8,000 of them are in the University of Michigan, okay? There are 40 million immigrants in the U.S. 600,000 of them are in Michigan. 44,000 are in Washtenaw County, right? So there's no reason. You don't have to go to China to take a deep dive. You can do it right here. Um, and then when you're an outsider, you don't have to anticipate discrimination. So yes, I ordered sewer rat in, um, in Paris, but I've also done a lot of ordering mistakes in Dearborn, uh, where it's 30 minutes away from here, but it's the population is predominantly Arab. And so um, you can uh, be very much an outsider right here, but again, you don't have to anticipate uh, having discriminatory experiences. So um, I'm now hungry for Indian food and raita. Are you? <laughs> but um, let me end actually with a quote. And this is from an article uh, recently in the New York Times about what it's like to marry a foreigner. Okay? And so when you make a family with someone from another country, you get double the music, double the movies, double the teams to pull for, double the holidays. And I want to underscore this, when you make a family with someone from another country, you don't have to go abroad and stay with a host family to do that. You don't have to marry a foreigner to do that. Um, you can do that right here with the hundreds of international students and immigrants and expats in this very community. So um, with that, let me end. And I want to thank my um, collaborators. And um, thank you again for coming. And uh, yes, go to Indian food after that and try the raita if you haven't. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. That was great. Um, so I'm, on one of the early slides, you showed that I think it was the immigrant group that had the highest cultural adaptation. They were the, and I'm, I'm wondering what you make of that and whether there were also other indices of their global capital that um, corresponded with that finding. Right, that's a, that's a good question. So this is the graph where I showed that the third culture kids are lowest in everything, right? And Patty here was um, not just focusing on the red bars like I, instructed everyone, but actually I can see now that she was looking at other bars that I said don't look at them, but she looked at them. And she noticed that across all the different domains of cultural adaptation, immigrants did the best. Okay, young immigrants did the best. Um, so I, I believe, let me tell you first why I think the third culture kids did so badly. It's just as a contrast, because both the third culture kids and the immigrants moved to a foreign country at a very young age, right? They were both young when they moved. Um, studies of third culture kids, and there are not a lot of them, uh, found that these young kids that had to move all over the world, you know, starting when they were four, they were miserable. They had a terrible time. They're constantly switching schools. They could not find friends. 
And so in these more qualitative studies, this, these kids were talking about, I couldn't care less about what country I'm moving to. I, I don't care about the language. I don't want to learn the culture. Just give me some friends. You know, I just want some friends. So they were almost sort of disengaging from the culture, you know, sort of the, because the more they moved around, the, sort of the more they disengaged. Um, I think the young immigrants are in a totally different situation. So they're young when they moved, and so they're still sort of in their formative years, but they could actually settle down and make friends. And, you know, they, they, they can learn the language. They want to know the culture. So they're, they're eager to assimilate, you know, and they're not um, so miserable as the third culture kids uh, for moving around. So I think actually that is a, um, a very good illustration of why more can be worse, especially for the young kids who haven't developed a, a clear cultural identity for themselves. Yes. Someone else uh, over here? Hi, Fiona. Hi, Miles. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I thought the inclusion of historical migration patterns was pretty interesting. Look at that as like a proxy for these relationships. And I'm curious if you guys tested other factors, particularly across countries, whether it was like GDP of the country or globalization of the country or just openness mm -hmm. to Western media to see if those factors kind of have a parallel process right. there. Sarah, do you want to answer that question? <laughs> no. Well, are you sure? Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. But I know hang, she hang will on. have a good answer for that. Um, yeah, so we did look at GDP. Um, the historical migration was actually designed to predict, by economists, to predict economic development. So we controlled for GDP in all of those analyses and the effects still hold. Um, we've also looked at some other contextual factors like individualism, collectivism. Um, individualism also seems to predict adaptation. So countries that are more individualistic, people adapt more in those countries as well. No. It's perfect. Okay, question perfect. over here. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Courtney. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, and I know you said you can't randomly assign people to countries, but do you know if people look like the other people in the countries they were going to? So being an Asian American, going to an Asian country, being black, going to a country in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, because I wonder if the, the cultural adaptation had to do with if people didn't know that I was a foreigner. Right. If I go to China, people go, no, I'm not from there. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to go to South Africa or to another country in West Africa, I don't know if that would be the same. Oh, so, right. so do you know that information, and do you think that would have an effect? Yeah. I mean, that's a very good question. And in a way, that's why historical migration is very different from current diversity of the country. So what you're talking about is current diversity. What does everybody look like when you walk into the room? And... Um, and again, that, that could be a more short-term thing, or it could be related to historical migration, but not necessarily so. So I'll give you an example. Dominican Republic is a country that is probably pretty homogeneous when you look at ethnicity. When you like, go there now and you look around, probably people look like you know, ethnically very similar. But it has one of the highest historical migration rates. Okay? So um, even though people look homogeneous, they have a history of people moving in, you know, from hundreds and hundreds of years. So it reflects a sort of a deeper value around accepting uh, foreigners rather than just currently what people look like. Swaziland is another example of um, uh, one of the countries that are highest in historical migration, but probably ethnically looking very similar. So, yeah, so I think they, they could be related, but there are different uh, variables that might indicate different things in each of these cultures. You have a question. I think there was another yeah. hand up here. Yes. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what you count as success in the global world. Are mm -hmm. you basically talking about uh, doing real well and becoming CEO of multinational corporations? Uh, I'm talking about getting a bento this, box named hmm? after you. I'm talking about getting a bento box named after you. <laughs> Getting a lunchbox that looks like your face. But that's, no. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes, go on with your question. Sorry I interrupted. Yes. Well, well the other thing is that uh, a lot of this sounds like talk that relates to the privileged elites. 
for the average individual audience, we don't see how any of this yeah. has any significance. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, let, let me address the second question first about um, really the study focusing on elites. And I, I totally agree. So in these studies, I'm talking about these MBA students or Carlos Goshen and you know, st uh, you know, study abroad students. And they are certainly a very elite group um, of individuals. So um, one, one, some of the studies I did not talk about, so I've also done a lot of studies on immigrants. And, um, and I'm hoping with uh, Mari, we can soon start some studies on refugees. So these will be a very, uh, these are very different. So I didn't talk about these findings, but it's um, their cultural adaptation um, is very different from the MBAs and the business executives. Um, so they're very different dynamics. So I'm glad you brought it up. This does not apply to um, when, when we're looking at immigrants or refugees, not all of this apply. And so I think it's very important that um, we, we acknowledge that. And um, sad if you can squeeze me in next year or next semester, maybe I'll talk about you know, cultural adaptation of refugees and um, immigrants. And then your first question was, oh, what do you mean, uh, yeah, by success? And so I think, you know, that's, that's a very good question, too. I mean, I sort of just talked about cultural adaptation, you know, how, how people, you know, whether they master the language, whether they consume uh, the local media, whether they make friends in the local country, or creativity, um, um, or cultural intelligence. Yeah, but I did not really link any of those skills to anything else, you know. So, um, yeah, so, so I stopped there and... Um, and I, I agree, I mean, these variables in and of itself might not be that valuable, and so you have to, you have to question yeah, them. Yeah, yes. cultural adaptation always a good thing. I agree. I agree. I agree. So, a lot of situations where it definitely is not. If you're going to go over to Iran and take on hardline Muslim attitudes towards women, mm -hmm. I don't find yeah, that. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to support that. Right. Right. Well, an adaptation that does, it's not necessarily being like you know people from the other culture. It's changing the way you think, changing the way you behave because you're a different culture. That doesn't necessarily you copy them. Okay. So, uh, but yes, that's true. Cultural adaptation may not always be a good thing. Cultural intelligence not always a good thing. Creativity is not always a good thing. So, good point. Yes, that's a question. Okay, someone yeah. else? Okay, right here. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned this concept of cultural intelligence and mm -hmm. how it's not necessarily um, relating to your knowledge of a specific culture, but um, knowledge in general, similar mm -hmm. to how I IQ is not specific knowledge, but more general. Yeah. So just for my own curiosity, I was wondering how exactly do you measure or did you measure cultural intelligence in your research um, when comparing it among the different populations that you were looking at? It's done with a survey with self-reports. So we ask them questions about um, what do you enjoy, to what extent do you enjoy being in a culturally diverse environment? Or to what extent are you aware of cultural differences when you're interacting with other people? Um, to what extent do you adjust your nonverbal behaviors or your gestures when you're with people from other cultures? So it's sort of like a survey uh, that people sort of fill in with a lot of items, each of them measuring these different components okay. of cultural intelligence. Would you say yeah. it's primarily um, like self-reflection type questions, not necessarily um, specific no. questions um, pertaining to knowledge, but really just how they're perceiving their own knowledge and reactions? Right, right. so it's... It's just sort of based on their self-reflection rather sure. than any, you know, us watching them performing any task. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Oh dear. So um, I really appreciated both of the last two questions. And I have um, worked with children who are from um, interfaith marriages. Okay. And I see those as uh, a really interesting demographic that's growing in this country mm -hmm. where you kind of end up with your end result. You get double the holidays, yeah. um, double the fun, double the movies. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
to answer the gentleman's question about, uh, you know, is this only for elites? I think, uh, you know, children from interfaith marriages is a growing demographic, and that is not reserved for the elite. So, so I think they are getting that exposure in ways that other countries where the word interfaith doesn't even exist are not. Um, and also, one of the things I did that I liked what you said about getting this without leaving Ann Arbor is I had my students video conference with Muslim students in Jakarta about issues of just talking about identity, community, and faith. These are middle school students. So, you know, even at this young age, they're able to develop those, this cultural intelligence, mm -hmm. which I think, back to his other question about what is success, I don't think it has to be being a Carlos Goshen. The success oh. is, um, are you going to be able to solve the world's practical problems together? Because they're global problems now. And the more you can adapt culturally and understand and see from the other perspective, the more likely you're going to succeed in that, in that regard. So mm -hmm. that's all. Well, let me just say one thing. I'm glad, um, very glad you mentioned that too. I talked about culture as like a, 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 a related to countries or where, where they are, you know. So in Brazil and Japan and China. So I'm talking about how culture resides in these different countries. But culture resides in religion, right? So different religions have different values and assumptions. And... Um, uh, you know that 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 we make and norms and rituals and routines. So, so there are many ways to think about culture. It doesn't only reside in countries or based on nationality or where we live, but you know, um, it's in our religion. It's you know in our class. You know, social class. I mean, in a lot of different groupings, I think we can apply the sort of same theory and same ideas. So, thanks. I'm really glad you. Oh, is it on? Okay. I'm really glad you pointed out the benefits of raita. You know? Oh, <laughs> delicious! It's delicious. Because yeah. As somebody who lived in India for four years and studied there and traveled all over the country, you know, I love ranch dressing too, but I prefer raita. Yes. <laughs> um, no, and there are many different Good forms. For you. So you don't yes. have to have just tomato and onion and cucumber. There are so many different kinds. Oh, okay. Um, but oh. um, I'm really glad about the, the point that you brought up about, you know, how even in this country, you can see so many mixtures. I have, um, our family's from India, and I have a, a brother who married somebody who was American Jewish, and my nephew and nieces are straddling many different <laughs> holidays and cultures, and of course they appreciate all the gifts we give. They demand them and they appreciate them. We make sure they appreciate them. <laughs> but uh, uh, because they're getting triple the amount, mm -hmm. not just double. But I think it also boils down to, um, you know, uh, the, the choices you make and um, how big you want you, to make your world. You don't, like you said, you don't have to leave um, Washtenaw County. You don't even have to leave Ann Arbor. Okay. But it's really the choices you make. You know, um, for instance, this student, I'm not going to criticize her because it is hard when you go to a new country and you're young and, you know, having had experiences of eating something I shouldn't have eaten and being really, really sick afterwards um, for a long period of time. I mean, you have to be careful, of course. Um, but uh, the thing is, e even locally, you know, Every now and then, step outside your comfort zone a little and go to, you know, a movie and see what that's like. Or, or you know, from another country, especially in a place like Ann Arbor, where a lot of times they're free. But uh, I have come across my fair share of people, having lived in New York, here, and elsewhere, and in India, who some people just, no matter how much the resources are available, it's really up to them whether or not they want to broaden their horizons or to... Um, make their world a little bigger. Um, and I hope this student fared well with the Raita for the time that she couldn't find ranch. I know in the big cities you can find ranch. <laughs> but in that kind of tropical heat, really, Raita is better for you anyway. Okay. Well, you make a very compelling argument. I will remember that next time I give this talk. But that's very eloquently said. I, I couldn't have said that better. Someone else? Okay. All right. Thank well, you so thank much. Thank you for very coming. much. Good night.